Hello, I'm Kristen Stevenson with Mississippi State University Extension in Hancock County, coming to you today for the first of the uh, presentations I'll be making through distance video uh, using Zoom and other platforms. Uh, today I'd like to talk to you about how to reduce uh, plant pests in the home landscape by using plant diversity. So we we'll want to begin talking about what a pest is. So a pest is defined as any organism that is noxious or destructive or troublesome to our interests. And that can include, include a lot of different kinds of organisms, things like insects uh, and fungi, bacteria, even nematodes, uh, even things like birds and armadillos and raccoons can be pests for our home landscape. One thing that's very critical when we talk about pests is that very often uh, the status of an organism as being a pest is dependent on the population of that organism in the environment. Uh, so very often the pests will cause damage based on the number of them that are present in our landscape. Uh, very rarely is it that one individual organism is going to be a serious problem uh, they just don't do enough damage to, to cause the kind of uh, harm that we would consider uh, worth managing. Uh, so the idea in managing pests is for, to reduce that population down below a threshold where they cause damage. And out of this, we get the concept of what we call an economic injury level. Um, and that is the population at which that uh, pest can cause actual harm to what we're trying to grow. And that's a very easy concept to get our heads around uh, when we're talking about the production of vegetables or if we're talking about the production of agronomic crops like soybean or cotton or corn, because we look at the value of the produce that comes out of that production. Um, when we're talking about ornamental plants, it's a little bit more difficult to establish an easy population level where we need to have that treatment. So we have the idea of an aesthetic injury level. Uh, and that's the population of that organism where it's doing enough damage to the appearance of the plants that we have in our landscape that it merits taking some control action. One of the really key ideas when we talk about pest management, whether that be insect management or disease management, is that idea of an economic threshold. And you can see on the chart that's on this slide, uh, as the line grows, goes across the slide, uh, the populate, that's the measure of the population of the pest. Uh, and that population kind of rises and falls throughout the, the season or over time. Uh, and there's a line there. And where that population crosses that line, uh, that's where we need to take some action in order to prevent damage to the plants that we're growing. Um, so one of the primary goals in cultural management of plants is to prevent that pest population from ever reaching a level where we need to have some sort of intervention to reduce that population. Uh, so there are some qualities in a landscape that make us more prone to have problems with pests. Uh, part of that is just the susceptibility of plants to, uh, to disease or to insects. And so some plants are going to be more susceptible to a particular pathogen. Uh, some plants are going to be more susceptible to insect damage than others are. And the selection of plants that are not susceptible is something that's really valuable for us as a way to avoid problems. Uh, another factor that can be really important is monoculture. And you can see the picture down there at the, the bottom of this image. Uh, that's a, of course, that's a, a, a cornfield. Uh, and all of those plants are essentially the same plant over and over again. And that provides a really easy environment for a pest population to grow very large very quickly. Another factor that I won't be speaking a lot on today is plant stress, other than to say uh, that stress can, can sort of predispose plants to being more vulnerable to insect damage or to disease damage. So keeping your plants healthy, uh, ensuring that they have good fertilization, that they were planted properly, uh, that they have all of the water requirements that they need is going to reduce the potential for stress 
and make your plants more able to resist damage from any pests. Uh, so some ways that we can use uh, our landscapes to reduce pest problems include the use of native plants, the, the use of plant diversity, uh, and as well as the support of beneficial wildlife. And I'm going to spend some time talking about each of those today. Uh, native plants, a topic I really enjoy. Uh, native plants are used in the environment the same as you would use any other ornamental garden plant. Um, the, advantage is, the advantages of native plants are that they're better adapted to our soils, they're better adapted to the weather and the environment here, and so that's going to help them avoid stress, going to help them grow very easily here, uh, and uh, they're also adapted to some of the pests that we have here. Uh, so that's going to allow them to more easily tolerate the conditions that they're in. Uh, another advantage of native plants is that they're critical for wildlife. The, all of our pollinators and all of our uh, birds uh, need these plants as a source of food and a source of shelter. So adding those into the home landscape allows us to provide them space in our home landscape. Uh, of course, one of the parts of native plants that I particularly enjoy uh, is that they tend to require a little bit less maintenance. Uh, they don't need to be uh, taken care of quite as much um, because they're adapted to our, home, to our environment. Uh, you can put them in, and while you certainly need to take care of them, they just require a little bit less work than uh, an exotic species. So when you're selecting native plants, one of the really easy ways to do that is to look at the plants that are already growing in the environment. Look at the surrounding existing vegetation because those species are very likely to perform well in our home landscape. So things that are already growing on the site, uh, things that are growing on fence lines, uh, looking around at neighboring properties for what's uh, doing very well, uh, those plants that you see are demonstrating their suitability for the site where you're planting them. And that makes, a really, makes them really good options for inclusion in our landscapes. Uh, some native plants that I particularly enjoy uh, and this is by no means an exhaustive list. And we're starting off with some trees here. Um, my personal favorite is the Eastern Redbud. I really enjoy those very early appearing flowers. Uh, just a really uh, beautiful thing. You see them along roadsides all the time. Uh, and they do fantastically well in the home landscape as well. Uh, red maple is another beautiful plant. Uh, gives us some fall color. Uh, as well as have, has those early developing flowers, uh, crab apple with all the beautiful flowers you see on that. Uh, American holly and other hollies do uh, fantastic here in Mississippi, uh, provide a lot of habitat for birds and bees and other pollinators. Uh, river birches are wonderful, uh, excellent shade trees and have a really interesting bark. And of course, we're in Mississippi, so we have to mention Southern Magnolia as a beautiful landscape tree. Uh, if you're interested in other trees that are excellent and native to here in Mississippi, MSU Extension has a publication on native trees for Mississippi landscapes that I definitely encourage you to take a look at. Uh, in terms of some shrubs that work fantastically well here in Mississippi, and again, not an exhaustive list, uh, sweet olive up there in the top left of your screen, a uh, beautiful plant, a wonderful aroma that comes off of it. Uh, red buckeye and fringe trees. Uh, down there in the bottom left, you see one of our native azaleas. It's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, and another personal favorite of mine there in the, the middle of the bottom of your screen is American beautyberry. And that's just a, another beautiful landscape plant uh, for here in Mississippi. And again, uh, there's an excellent extension publication on this. It's native shrubs for Mississippi landscapes. And I highly encourage you to go and take a look through that. Uh, for some ideas for plants to add into your home landscape. Uh, so moving away from that topic of native plants, I want to uh, spend uh, just a couple minutes talking about monoculture. Uh, monoculture is just what it sounds like. It's growing one plant in the landscape, sort of repeated over and over again, having a lot of the same species of plant all grouped together. Uh, and the example that I'm using for this, uh, at least my first example, 
uh, is the street. Uh, and all, all along that street, what you see, those nice, wonderful, stately trees are all American elms. And they are absolutely gorgeous. They do fantastically well. Uh, and they were planted all along streets uh, in the United States, in the National Mall in Washington, D.C. And unfortunately, uh, there was a pest that was introduced that was damaging to these trees. Uh, it's known as Dutch elm disease, uh, and it was spread a couple of different ways, uh, but primarily by a bark beetle. Uh, and having these large runs or large areas planted uniformly with these plants, unfortunately, uh, made it very easy for that Dutch elm disease to spread from plant to plant, uh, leading to the decline of these trees. Uh, so this is a picture taken from Ohio, uh, and what you're looking at is a soybean field. Uh, and in the midst of that field, you have a native prairie strip that's been introduced uh, as a way to increase plant diversity uh, for the environmental benefits that come along with that. Uh, and the environmental benefits that they found when doing this uh, were actually really great. Um, the, uh, there are some benefits in terms of uh, soil health, um, just uh, converting 10% of the cropped area to these prairie conservation strips reduced soil loss by 95%, uh, reduced, uh, reduced phosphorus loss uh, in surface runoff by 77%, uh, nitrate concentrations in groundwater reduced by 72%, uh, total nitrogen losses in surface runoff by 70%, compared with uh, all crop watersheds. So another aspect of that, besides the soil health, is that the pollinator and bird abundance in that area more than doubled by the introduction of these prairie strips. And that provides enough advantage to justify using that space to introduce those conservation strips. So crop diversity has a significant impact on the rest of the diversity that we're going to see in a landscape. So uh, growing plants in your garden that pest insects don't like to eat uh, is going to make, it, make them have to work harder to find the plants that they do like to eat. Uh, so some examples of that uh, using a squash planting. So white flies can be a serious insect pest in a wide range of crops. You can also see those in uh, ornamentals. Uh, so mixing squash plantings with buckwheat uh, allowed us to reduce the number of white flies we had on our on the squash, uh, which is a great way to reduce plantings. Uh, sort of another example of that, what I'll talk a little bit more about in a second, uh, is growing crepe myrtles along the edge of the garden to attract crepe myrtle aphids. We'll talk about the use of these uh, non-crop pests a little bit here in just a second. Uh, so one idea of using plant diversity to reduce plant pests is the use of a trap crop. Uh, so a trap crop is a crop that's going to attract the pest insect away from your food crops in the example of a vegetable garden. Now these are going to work best when they're planted at the edge of the garden uh, or along a fence row or in movable containers. And you want to keep a space of about five feet or so between your trap crop and your actual garden. Uh, one thing I, I really enjoy is planting those trap crops in containers. It makes it very easy to remove them from the garden area after they've served their purpose. Another uh, thing you can do is, is plant the same crop earlier, uh, use that to attract those very early season pests, eliminate them on that early crop, uh, so you don't have as much of a problem going forward through the season. Uh, one thing that I, I definitely want to make sure I mention when we're talking about trap crops is while you're attracting those pest insects uh, to, uh, to those other plants, uh, you want to make sure that you treat those plants, uh, treat, the, treat for those insects on that trap crop to ensure that the population doesn't build and then spread to your uh, intentional plants or your food plants. Uh, so a topic I'm really interested in is the use of banker plants. And the idea of a banker plant is that banker plant actually promotes the population of non-crop pests. 
so pests that might be non-damaging to the crops that you're growing. A really good example of that uh, is the crepe myrtle and crepe myrtle aphid. I mentioned this a few moments ago. Uh, crepe myrtle aphid is uh, very common on crepe myrtles, uh, but it's also very selective on the plants that it will feed. Uh, so crepe myrtle aphids essentially really only feed on crepe myrtles. And because of that, the aphid population is a really easy place for beneficial insect populations to build up, feeding on those crepe myrtle aphids, uh, and then also going on and spreading into uh, the other parts of your landscape where those beneficial insects can reduce pest populations on your other plants. Uh, another really good example of that is the use of the bird cherry oat aphid. Uh, it's very selective to feed only on grasses, uh, and so barley can be introduced as a way to support the population of bird cherry oat aphids, uh, can be fed on either by uh, lady beetles or other beneficial insects like parasitic wasps, uh, that then offer again some protection to the other plants that you're growing. Uh, the other image I have on this slide is of papaya plants being placed in a uh, tomato production greenhouse, uh, and that is to build up the population of a parasitic wasp uh, that reduces populations of white flies. So by introducing those papaya, they build up the population of that parasitic wasp and allow, it allows them to control the white flies on their tomatoes. It's also important to think about plant diversity over time. Uh, and we uh, usually refer to this as crop rotation. Uh, and so one of the things that happens as you grow plants in the same place over and over again um, is that the pests and the insects and the diseases that might affect a particular group of plants tend to accumulate in that space. So by planting a different crop following uh, what you planted this year, uh, you prevent a little bit of that buildup and it allows you to keep the population of those pests down. And, you know, again, I'm using an example from vegetable production, uh, and you can see these three groups of different vegetables uh, in group A. Uh, you have watermelons, and cucumbers, and squash, uh, what we call the cucurbits. They uh, are all very similar. They're affected by, uh, similarly by a range of different pests and diseases. And so following that, you would want to plant something in either group B or group C in order to prevent the buildup of those pest populations. It's the same uh, following if you were planting tomatoes in an area, you would wanna follow those tomatoes with something in another group to prevent the buildup of those uh, damaging pests. Uh, another concept in diversity that we can use to help manage pest populations in our landscape, uh, again, particularly for vegetable production, uh, is the use of cover crops and green manure. Now, a cover crop is generally planted on the off-season, uh, but they can also be planted in between rows and tilled at, a, at the right time. And what that does, particularly with legumes, is allows us to build up nitrogen in the soil, build up other nutrients in the soil, uh, and improve, the so improve soil health. Uh, while they're growing, uh, they suppress weeds, um, and prevent other plants from growing up in that same space. They just crowd them out. Uh, they also, because of the presence of the roots there in the soil, prevent erosion. Uh, they can have beneficial effects in reducing the populations of nematodes. Uh, and also really important, they can provide habitat for beneficial insects. Uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, as I was starting off, the use of resistant varieties. Uh, you can see here, uh, we have uh, two different examples of the same species of plant. Uh, one looks an awful lot better than the other. Uh, and this is an example of a resistant variety. Uh, these are impatiens uh, and uh, infected with a, a disease called downy mildew. Uh, and the one that you'll see on your right uh, is resistant. The one that you see on your left is not. And you can see by the selection of those resistant varieties, uh, you can avoid a lot of the problems that you might otherwise have. And particularly if you have a history of a particular pest in your landscape, if you have a history of a particular disease, it's a really great idea to do some research, uh, track down some of these resistant varieties, 
it'll solve a lot of problems in the home landscape from the date that you plant. Uh, of course, you can always contact your county extension agent to suggest some resistant varieties. They'll be great to, uh, to help you out. Uh, I'd like to take some time talking about attracting beneficial insects to the home landscape. Uh, and the ideal way to do that is to provide them the three things that they really need. Uh, they need food, water, and shelter in order to be uh, viable in your landscape, to have a good time there. Uh, so we want to make sure that we provide them the food sources they need, provide them the water sources they need, provide them the shelter they need. Uh, so some ways we can do that is by the integrate using flowers near vegetable gardens, uh, using types of plants that are particularly attractive to beneficial insects and to pollinators. Uh, obviously, if we're, we're trying to build up populations of beneficial insects, we want to limit our insecticide applications because those insecticide applications uh, can reduce the populations of beneficial insects as well. Uh, and again, we do need to provide them water sources. Uh, in, uh, insects like butterflies like to uh, take water up uh, from mud puddles or from water that's on, on rock that's set out in the garden. Uh, that's a great way to provide them a water source. Uh, so growing a diversity of plants, particularly plants with a large number of blooms, uh, can uh, promote the populations of beneficial insects. Uh, many of the adult uh, of, of the species that are beneficial, uh, like predators and parasites, uh, feed on nectar while the immatures feed on uh, pest insects. So it's important to have those nectar sources available for those beneficial insects. Uh, of course, the integration of those nursery strips planted with a variety of different plants that bloom at different times, provide habitat and nectar sources for them. Uh, and you want to avoid using any plants that might be a host to a major pest, one of the crops that you might be growing. Uh, so to talk a little bit about some specific beneficial insects, probably the most famous one is the lady beetle. Uh, the adults of most of these species are yellow or red and have that really characteristic oval body shape. Uh, and often they have dark spots on their wing covers. Uh, the larvae are a little bit more difficult to recognize. You can see a picture there at the bottom. Uh, and they have a shape, we call it alligator shaped. Uh, their bodies are usually dark with uh, either yellow or red or orange markings on them. Uh, but both the adults and the immatures of lady beetles are predators on aphids and white flies. Uh, so some plants that work really well for attracting uh, lady beetles to your home landscape. Uh, really good examples of some plants that are both attractive and attractive to beneficial insects include tansy, uh, basket of gold, uh, yarrow. And one of the things I like to tell people, one of the best way to uh, keep pollinators, to keep butterflies, uh, beneficial insects in your home landscape is an herb garden. So plants like dill and cilantro and fennel are fantastic re uh, resources for young caterpillars that are going to turn into beautiful butterflies, as well as these beneficial insects. I do want to take a quick note here uh, to talk about the release of lady beetles. Uh, it's one of the things you can, um, you can purchase large numbers of lady beetles to ship to you. Uh, and very often, uh, that's not going to be very effective. Uh, as you release those lady beetles, they have a tendency to fly, off, uh, fly away from your landscape. Uh, rather than stick around. So having these resources there for them uh, is the best way to attract them and to build up that population. Uh, lace wings are another group of beneficial insects. Uh, the adult green lace wing is uh, kind of a slender green insect. You can see a picture down there at the bottom. Uh, I have long antennae and those longs are lace-like wings, um, usually uh, just over half an inch long. Uh, brown lace wings are very similar, or just a little bit smaller, uh, and they're brown rather than being green. Uh, now, uh, the adults uh, of the green lace wings don't feed on insects. The adult of brown lace wing does, uh, but a lot of what we're going to see in terms of beneficial impact for lace wings is going to be the immatures. Uh, they have a fairly similar immature, uh, that same sort of alligator-shaped uh, larvae uh, that we see in lady beetles. Uh, and they can be predators of aphids and white flies. 
And the picture you see there at the top is of a lacewing immature feeding on a caterpillar. Uh, some plants that are really attractive to lacewings, uh, dandelion is a, a wonderful one, angelica, uh, prairie sunflower is a wonderful plant to include, not only for its attractiveness to uh, beneficial insects, but also because of those beautiful blooms. Uh, and then also, also caraway and Queen Anne's lace. Uh, another group of beneficial insects are the searfid flies. Uh, sometimes these get called hoverflies, and other times they get called bee flies. Uh, and you can see why they might be called a bee fly. Uh, the searfid flies are mimics of bees. Uh, they have that uh, yellow and black coloration as a warning to anything that might try to mess with them. Uh, but they are entirely harmless, they don't sting. Uh, and a lot of the larvae uh, of these searfid flies are specialized predators of aphids. And you can see a picture down there at the bottom uh, of an immature searfid fly um, eating an aphid. Um, like bees, oftentimes we're gonna see these insects hovering around flowers. Um, the way you can really tell them from, uh, from bees is that they only have one pair of wings. Uh, but generally speaking, we don't want to mess with either our uh, hoverflies or with our bees that might be uh, moving around our flowers. Uh, some plants that work really well to attract uh, searfid flies are lavender globe lily, and purple poppy mallow. Uh, lavender, again, wonderful plant to have in the landscape, uh, both, as a, uh, both for its attractiveness uh, and because it is a good plant to have around for beneficial insects. Uh, and getting back to that herb garden I was talking about, uh, spearmint is a, a wonderful attractant to these insects as well. Uh, parasitic wasps uh, are an interesting group of, uh, of wasps. Uh, very, they tend to be very small wasps. Uh, and what they do is they, they lay their eggs inside the uh, pest. So that might be uh, aphids and that might be caterpillars. Uh, there's a, quite, a, quite a number of different parasitic wasp species out there. Uh, and you can see some pictures there. Uh, what you see down in the bottom left is one of these parasitic wasps injecting its egg into that caterpillar, which will then develop inside the caterpillar uh, and, uh, and prevent it from being a problem. Uh, down there on the, on the uh, right side of the screen, uh, you can see uh, all of those uh, white uh, things coming off the caterpillar, those are pupil cases. So all of those larvae have developed inside that hornworm. Uh, and are, have come out and are now ready to go out and, uh, uh, and pupate and fly off as the adult wasp. Uh, there in the middle, uh, some parasitic wasps will actually attack the eggs rather than the immature stage of uh, different insects. Uh, and so that wasp is actually laying its egg inside the egg of a potential pest. Um, now, really important for parasitic wasps, the adults are nectar feeders. Uh, so plants that are really good for them, they need to have those nectar sources. Uh, getting back to our herb garden, we have parsley and lemon balm, uh, different kinds of thyme, uh, as well as some really attractive uh, flowers like tansies and cosmos are wonderful plants to include to attract parasitic wasps. Just want to close out talking just a little bit about gardening for birds. Uh, birds can feed on insects as well, so uh, always great to have them in our landscape to, uh, to do that, uh, just as well as to enjoy the presence of the birds. So when, when we want to garden for birds, we want to make sure that we include a variety of edges. They really like those um, different edges that we might have in our landscape. They really like perches that face out into open areas. Uh, so they can scan the environment for uh, any food sources. Uh, and they, diff they have uh, differences in, in different species and which height in the landscape they like to be. So having different plant heights allows you to create more environments for a greater diversity of birds. So use large and small shrubs and ground, co ground covers as a way to present that layered environment. Uh, of course, you do want to know the diet of the birds you're trying to attack. Uh, and again, avoid the use of pesticides as much as you can uh, because those birds require a lot of insects to feed on 
particularly when they're nesting and supporting the next generation. Uh, here we just have a couple of pictures of cardinal and blue jay um, doing exactly what I would like them to do, getting rid of some caterpillar pests in the landscape, uh, and then a picture of a, a really well-designed landscape to incorporate that uh, space for birds. Uh, so we're just kind of final notes here. Uh, know your pests. The more we can uh, know specifically what pest we're trying to control, the better job we can do of managing it. So uh, proper identification can be really critical to providing effective management. Um, and the same plants tend to get the same pests on a fairly regular basis. So knowing the pests that are going to be very common for the plants that you're growing uh, just definitely pre um, prepares you to manage them uh, because those different pests may require different treatments. And again, your county extension office is a wonderful resource for identification of pests. Uh, there are a number of publications that I definitely encourage you to go and take a look at. Uh, we have a publication for insect pests of vegetable gardens and insect pests of ornamentals, uh, as well as some disease specific uh, publications for particular crops. Uh, there's an excellent publication that came out on the on diseases of tomatoes uh, that I encourage you to uh, look up on our website. Uh, and I've mentioned several times as I've spoken, we want to reduce the use of insecticides in our home landscapes. Uh, and that really comes down to those insecticide applications, uh, killing not only the target pest, but also any beneficial insect we might have. I want to bring your uh, mind back uh, to that uh, diagram we had early in the talk when I was talking about economic thresholds. Uh, we don't want to spray unless we need to spray. However, we also don't want to let concern for beneficial insects prevent us from spraying when we need to in order to protect our plants. So keep in mind that population. Keep in mind that while it's excellent to, to have those beneficials there, to keep that population of pests from reaching a level where they cause damage, uh, once they have crossed that threshold, once that population has increased beyond that population level, uh, that's the time when we do need to have some kind of intervention, the spray of an insecticide or a pesticide uh, in order to reduce that population. Now, uh, again, in identifying pests, we can select a, a pesticide it's going to be very select, uh, very selective for that particular pest. A really good example of that is the use of thuricide or Bt, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, because that insecticide is very specific to just uh, affect caterpillars. So we can spray that in order to reduce caterpillar populations without damaging other, uh, other insects that might be there in the environment. Uh, the better we do in catching populations of insects early, uh, the better we do in pest identification, uh, the better we can manage those pest insects uh, without doing any harm to our beneficial, beneficial insects. So thank you very much for joining me today uh, for, this, uh, for this discussion. I will be having several of these over the coming weeks. Uh, the two I have scheduled uh, coming up will be in this following week. Uh, and that will be on uh, April 7th. I'll be giving a presentation at 6 p.m. on growing vegetables in containers. I'll have the link for that on Facebook, and I really encourage you to join me. Uh, and then April 9th at 2 p.m., I'll be giving a presentation on establishing wildflowers in your home landscape. So I encourage you to uh, join me for that. Uh, again, take a look at our web, uh, website, extension.msstate.edu. Engage with us on social media. Uh, again, thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you next time.